Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Redford, and this is The Follow-Up. Coming up on tonight's show, voting rights is on the statewide ballot here in Michigan on November 8th. It's Proposal 2, so what's at stake? Will it enhance voting rights or create more challenges for us? And at what cost to the taxpayers? Two people who work in the front lines of voting issues are with us tonight. One is with a statewide voting rights organization. The other is a county clerk here locally. But first, we would like to hear from you to help drive the conversation here on the show. You can do that in a variety of ways via social media, on Facebook and Twitter. You can email us or you can dial into our follow-up hotline to voice your opinion or suggest future show topics. And if you'd like to view any of our past shows, just log on to deltapublicmedia.org. So let's talk about voting rights, shall we? We have two guests uh, here on the follow-up tonight. Uh, follow-up, we have Nancy Wagg. She's joining us live via remote from Ann Arbor. She is executive director of the Voters not politicians, organizations. Nice to have you here, Nancy. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. And we have uh, Kathleen Zanotti. She is the Bay County Clerk. Uh, she's not too far from home, and she's joining me in the studio. Uh, Nancy, let, let me start with you. Uh, Voters Not Politician has had a history of success when it comes to getting these sort of voter-related statewide issues on the ballot and, and getting them passed. That's the trick, right? Mm -hmm. So kind of walk right. us through the history of our organization and how have you been so successful getting these uh, t through the voters? So Voters Not Politicians, uh, we rose up in 2017. We are a true grassroots, nonpartisan uh, group of Michiganders all across the state. And um, I think we're successful because we um, are, are trying to um, create things that, that all Michiganders um, support, Again, you know, regardless of your whether you're Republican or independent or Democrat, there are certain values that we all share. And um, two of them are fair elections and access to the ballot. So in 2017, you know, we um, saw that politicians weren't working for voters. And a big reason why was because they were manipulating our district lines, drawing our own, <clears throat> by drawing their own districts to keep themselves in power. Um, that was gerrymandering and they were doing it to kind of extreme levels, um, some of the most extreme across the country. So Voters Not Politicians, we put together a grassroots campaign to um, bring the issue to the voters and uh, put together an independent uh, redistricting commission that was um, for 13 Michigan citizens and voters, not politicians. And it took a lot of uh, work. Um, it was, you know, 6,000 um, uh, Michigan voters uh, who are all volunteers. Uh, we had to collect 428,000 signatures, um, and then we had to power through, um, you know, a campaign to put the issue on the ballot and to educate voters on why it was really important for us all to vote to take our power back in that way. Um, you know, fast forward uh, four years uh, later, our commission just finished up its work. It drew election district lines for the first time that are fair and impartial in Michigan's history, and because of what we did. You know, I was having put that reform on the ballot and 61% of voters passing it in 2018. That's why we have competitive elections this year. Um, what we put together uh, created fair maps where politicians now actually have to work for every vote, which is, of course, exactly what they are supposed to, you know, sure. have to do. Right. Um, and, um, you know, Part and parcel of that, though, that, that people power is that we actually need to also be able to vote and cast a ballot for who we want to represent our interests. Very good. And that, let me stop you there because I'm going to mm -hmm. let you go on a little bit more. we got, we got a little more time to get after it. I, I want to sure. get after a proposal, too. So, Kathleen, I'm going to come to you next. And b before we do that, I, I want the viewers and you guys to take a look at the proposal and what's on that, what is typically called the... Uh, the Voting Policies and Constitutional Amendment, there it is on your screen, uh, providing voters with the right to vote without harassment, interference, or intimidation, guaranteeing that military and overseas ballots postmarked by Election Day are counted, allow for a signed affidavit as an alternative to the existing photo ID requirement to vote, authorizing voters to drop off absentee ballots at drop boxes, 
allowing nine days of early voting, and then requiring public disclosure of donations from private entities that were used to pay for elections and or audits. So Kathleen, you've seen it. Uh, what do you like about the proposal overall, and what do you see as a clerk? Uh, maybe some challenge that you, you're going to have. Well, I support the proposal overall. Uh, you know, our goal as clerks is to get as many people to vote as we can. Um, you know, and especially some of these bullet points, like pro providing voters the right to vote without harassment or signing the affidavit um, as an alternative to having an existing photo ID. We already do that. You don't, we ask for your photo ID when you come to the polls, but if you do not have one, you can flip over the application and vote and sign the sworn affidavit saying that you are who you are. Uh, the big part of this proposal is that it puts it in the state constitution. So we don't go back and forth on, on how we administer these elections based on who controls the House or the Senate at that time. You know, for example, straight party ticket. Just had today. Can we vote straight party on the ballot? Uh, and the reason why I bring up that question is before in Michigan, we have the straight party. Then for a while it was off the ballot and now it's back on the ballot. Well, that's very confusing to voters and it's hard to administer an election when we flip flop on these ballot standards and voting standards. So um, those are the things that I really like about proposal two. Uh, the nine days of early voting will take a lot of implementation and a lot of work from local clerks, county clerks, the Bureau of Elections, everyone down the line. There will take a lot of training, a lot of guidance to figure out how to implement that. You know, especially in our more rural uh, places in the county and probably the state, mm -hmm. not every township or village even has a hall. You know, so to be open for nine days, it will, it might look different in different places. But I know that there is some consolidation that can be done, and I'm sure the legislation will probably figure out a be the best way to implement that. Okay. Um, well, Nancy, I'll let you follow up there. Some of the mm -hmm. challenges that this county clerk that's working every day on this, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, absolutely. So there will be, um, you know, there will be these rights that are enshrined in our constitution and in a lot of instances they um, are, are purely uh, protecting what you know the rules that we are already following um, just in making sure that politicians you know can't manipulate those rules and change them with changes in power um, but there are going to definitely going to be things that you know that we're going to have to implement and kind of work through um, after these uh, propo after this proposal passes and, and there is a cost to the taxpayers on this if indeed th this goes through. And as you guys said earlier, the legislature would still have to, uh, not amend it, but implement it at some point so that we'd have a little mm -hmm. time. So, but there was a cost. I don't know if you know how much that is, but I think that is something that some of us are thinking about. If county clerks uh, need to increase staff, if we have to have absentee ballot drop boxes placed throughout the community, um, I'll stay with you uh, on that, Nancy. Have you heard that from? Folks that are saying, man, this is going to cost, cost us in the pocketbook. Right. So, you know, we're approaching this in terms of the voter. So, you know, we want to make sure that all voters have access to the ballot, regardless of where they live, regardless of who they're voting for. And we need access for every voter, every eligible voter to be able to make their voice heard. Um, there are provisions in here that make sure that there is flexibility in terms of how some of these things are administered. Um, like Kathy just said, uh, with respect to consolidating um, early voting places, for example, um, you know some of this this stuff though also it's it's you know it's there are things that are going to be cost more cost effective because of this proposal. For example, if you have early in person voting, you have fewer absentee ballots that you need to process, and so there's going to be a lot of um, kind of uh, uh, saved resources as well, um, you know, because of some of these these rights that are then enshrined for voters in the Constitution. Kathleen, I'm going to come to you. A, a new law passed in the legislature here in the last couple of weeks allows you to start processing absentee ballots in advance, I think as much as two days in advance. You can't start counting them yet, but you can, you can start uh, you know, processing mm -hmm. them. Uh, how might that affect what you're doing? Is that helpful? It, are, you, are you preparing for that? It is helpful. Um, Absentee, because of the last 
proposal that was passed mostly because of Nancy's group, uh, our absentee ballots have increased quite a bit. Uh, just for example, I looked at the numbers of absentee applications that have been turned out, so every application that's returned will then be a ballot that's in the mail. Um, when I looked last week, it, there was over 20,000 applications that were received by our local clerks in Bay County. Now, just for context, in 2018, the last governor's race, there was about 42,000, I believe, total votes in the county. So we are already about halfway through the election with, at that time, more than a month ago. So people are voting by mail quite a bit more. Um, in Bay County in particular, we don't have the issues like the city of Detroit does, or maybe our other metro giant metropolitan cities within the state. We get through all of our absentee ballots with no problem at the end of an election day. Um, now our, our cities and townships that do have absentee counting boards, so boards that are only process absentee ballots, they do also have to stay open till that, past the end of the night because now anyone can drop off a ballot up until 8 o'clock on election day because of the last proposal that's been passed. So processing them does help. Um, it saves time. It allows our clerks to work on the election earlier than they could. So it all helps, but um, you know, I think the city of Detroit has over 500 precincts. You know, we have 50 some, so we don't have as many of the same challenges they do. Yeah, Nancy, are you hearing from other clerks <laughs> in maybe areas that are a lot more urban, I guess? Uh, concerns they may have about what it's going to take to tabulate process. Uh, you know, voters are impatient. They want to see the uh, results by the time the 11 o'clock news hits. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably not going to happen. It, it could be days or even weeks, uh, I suppose, uh, if you've got a close race. Is that a, that's a little bit of a challenge, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, it's really important to set expectations that there are going to be these absentee ballots that do need to be processed. Um, you know, the great thing about um, some of these reforms that voters have been passing, um, for example, in 2018, is, you know, by guaranteeing no reason absentee voting, that gave a lot of people a really convenient option so that and that people are using to, to make their voices heard. So, um, you know, we, we cast 3 million absentee um, uh, ballots in 2020. I think we're on track uh, to do that again this election. Um, and pre-processing is really important. I'm glad the legislature, you know, was able to, um, to pass something before the election. Yeah, personally, I like the trend toward absentee. Um, I think recently the numbers say that I think in the last big election, uh, I think as many as 60% of the votes cast were through absentee. Mm -hmm. uh, I think overall that, that, that's pretty good. Um, I know in the past you had to have some sort of an excuse, right? Well, I'm on vacation. Yeah. I had to work. Now you, you don't need any kind of excuse. You want an absentee. And so you're going to see that trend go up, uh, I'm assuming, right? I believe so. Yeah. 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 I mean, especially in Bay County, we have five countywide millages on the ballot, uh, three statewide millages on the ballot, and many other township ones, too. So, I mean, now someone can vote at their kitchen table and take time to read through those proposals instead of being rushed and trying to do it on their lunch break. Um, it, you know, there's just not enough time sometimes. So now someone can really just take their time and be an informed voter too. Nancy, I asked, I'm going to go in this direction now. One issue that comes up a lot, I think, has to do with sort of the voter verification, right? Um, if someone doesn't have a driver's license or a photo ID, and Kathleen mentioned a little bit of that earlier, they can sign the back of the ballot, right? It's a sworn affidavit. Back of the application to vote. Got it. Thank you for that, clearing that up. So the sworn statement, the affidavit, mm -hmm. basically says they are who they say they are. Mm -hmm. I, I think some critics will say, is, is that really enough? How, how can you really trust that? Uh, what, what would you say to that, Nancy, I guess? And, and Kathleen, you guys can go back and mm -hmm. forth on that issue. Sure. Well, I, I think it's important to note that, you know, in the last election, 99.8% of all voters did show a voter, you know, a photo ID as they mm -hmm. were voting at the polls. Um, that won't change. Um, you know, all uh, Proposal 2 does is enshrine our current laws, our current voter ID laws in the Constitution. Um, and those laws are, you know, as strict or stricter than 37 other states in the country. Um, so, you know, I know that there are people that continue to try to kind of, you know, sow this kind of distrust, but 
Um, our voter ID laws have been shown to be very safe and secure. And what this proposal would do would be to make um, that a permanent um, in our constitution. And yeah, I when I did audits in on the 2020 election, for example, I audited a precinct in Bay City, which is one which is our largest jurisdiction in Bay County. Uh, for that precinct, and I can't recall how many total votes, but there was maybe five total affidavits in that precinct. I mean, we're talking, like Nancy said, less than 1%. Most people are not signing this affidavit. They are showing valid picture ID. So it is not something that is very common, but it allows that person who doesn't have a photo ID or who maybe forgot it or lost it. You know, maybe they left their wallet mm -hmm. somewhere else, but, you know, should they forfeit the right to vote? Well, we don't really think so in Michigan. Um, so that's how we have that, why we have that rule. Uh, and then also we do allow for election poll challengers too. You know, so if you are appointed by a political party or a recognized organization, you can be an official challenger. And technically, if you know that someone is not who they say they are, they should not be voting, you can follow the procedure and actually challenge that person. And if they cannot take an oath, you know, uh, swearing that they are who they are, even though signing the affidavit is an oath in itself, sure. then, um, you know, I think they're actually could be charged with a misdemeanor. It, it's good to clear that up. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. Mm -hmm. if, you, uh, mm -hmm. if you read social media and, and some other media outlets, it, it makes it sound like the, the verification. There's a, a lot more mm -hmm. fraudulent voting going out there and the reality of it, that, that's proven not to be the case, right? Um, and, and, and on a related note, uh, uh, there's still fallout from the 2020 presidential election. I, I think the electorate out there still, there's some mistrust. Uh, many folks maybe are still questioning the results. Can they, can they trust the election? I mean, that was sort of the impetus of the insurrection of the Capitol. Um, so do you think proposals like this, uh, if indeed it pass over time, can bring sort of more trust back into, into what we're doing here? Nancy, go ahead. Yes, I think so. I mean, in general, I think the more people that engage with our electoral process see exactly how the procedures work, and then they come to, you know, they, they understand that it's a safe and secure process. I think, um, you know, clerks across our state are reporting that to be true. Um, and, and also, I, you know, there's, there's a difference between the rhetoric and then also what, you know, what voters on the ground are, are thinking and saying. And so that's something that we're doing is we have volunteers that are going door to door talking with people about these reforms um, that are in the proposal. And there's wide, wide support across parties. People want access, they want convenience, and they know that there's been no fraud proven whatsoever. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, I think the more people who vote, it, it's always best. Um, as far as clearing up doubts that people have about the 2020 election, you know, honestly, I just think voter education is key you know, in Michigan, we have that paper trail. So even if you have doubts about the tabulators, which are completely unfounded, you know, we have that paper ballot to prove. I, I have myself done the personal audits. I've done the hand counts. They come out perfectly every single time. Um, you know, so I, I guess the more people that, yeah, do participate in this and don't feel discouraged by rumors and doubts about the integrity of the election, that's for the best, um, but I, I also think we as probably administrators and just as a general public need to just understand our election process better. And I don't know if this helps, but you know, it at least gets people to participate more. Well, and I think we have to be reminded, we still have, I think, the best system in the world. I mean, you see what's happening over in, in Russia mm -hmm. right now, it gives you mm -hmm. pause a little bit. So yes, our system isn't perfect, uh, we, we need to change some things, which is what we're trying to do, but let's, mm -hmm. come on people, we still have the best uh, system in the world, and let's, let's try to make it better. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about sort of maybe volunteers, volunteer training, how people can get involved. Uh, Kathleen, I'm going to come to you. Uh, you've been preparing for this, um, trying to get m more folks involved, volunteers, you've got some staff, uh, mm -hmm. you've done some training. Talk, talk to me a little bit about the training you've done and how many folks you're trying to get, get ready for this. 
Yes, so uh, every election inspector, so people who work in your polling place, they have to be trained every uh, number of years to work that job. So as the county clerk, it's our responsibility to hold those trainings, um, you know, unless you have a jurisdiction with over a certain population. So the city of Bay City holds their own trainings. But I train everyone else in Bay County. So I trained over 300 people to be certified to work, uh, you know, for the next handful of years. Um, I haven't seen a shortage of volunteers so far. Now, I have had people who have not wanted to return uh, this election cycle, but I honestly think that that's mostly just because this day is getting busier. You know, we saw increased voter turnout in 2020, and it's just, it's a very long day to work an election. So, of course, we want more engagement. We want more workers so that someone doesn't have to work from 7 to 8. You know, maybe they can split up the day. So we would love to probably have double that. Uh, you know, I'd love to have 600 workers, not 300 workers. But uh, we, we don't quite have the shortage that, you know, people were maybe at one time worried about, good which is good. Be in. It's Na good. Nancy, with you, I mean, you're a statewide organization. Actually, I think you were telling me beforehand, you've got some folks working on some national initiatives. So w w what are your thoughts on how you mobilize these thousands of volunteers and get people to step up and do it? Well, you know, I, again, I think it's just appealing to all of our shared values of we want free elections, you know, we want fair and open elections, we want, the, you know, more people, as many people uh, to participate as possible. So one of the things we do is we mobilize people to, you know, knock on doors to get support, you know, and, and um, you know, the word out about Proposal 2. But we're also encouraging people to work as poll workers, to um, work as poll challengers. Um, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit, but we're, we're telling people this is about being engaged, being a part of you know good government, and making sure that everyone um, can vote and make their voice heard. And I think, you know, with all of this stuff that is going on, people really are kind of stepping up and and taking an active role in our elections, which is you know we're really really excited to see. One area I want to talk about, um, if indeed this passes on November eighth, we don't flip a switch and go yes we can implement right now. Um, maybe Nancy, you can touch on this, and uh, Kathleen, you can add to it. What happens when it passes? How soon could something like this be implemented? What are the things does it have to go through for, for this to, to happen? Well, certainly there is a process. So what this proposal would do is guarantee, for example, a fundamental right to vote without intimidation or harassment in our Constitution. That would be, you know, it would be enshrined in our Constitution um, I think it becomes, you know, part of our um, our constitution within like 45 days after election day, something like that. Um, but for other provisions like, you know, providing people with secure drop boxes for absentee ballots and things like that, there will be a process for, you know, legislation to to kind of implement those provisions. Um, but I think, you know, regardless of of the exact timing of of that process, the legislature would be required. To, to do the things, um, to put things in place so that the will of the people in passing the proposal would be done. Yeah, and Kathleen, I'm guessing if we say, if it passes and maybe it, the cycle would be the March elections, I guess, maybe at the earliest in the spring sometime, I'm guessing some funding would have to come from the state, some would have to come through the county commission, they'd have to approve some, some dollars there too. Is that a concern of yours, I guess, to implement something, you know, we don't have the money I, to do it maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, honestly, there would probably have to be money from the state, the county, and probably the township, cities, villages, wherever, you know, elections are being held. It will take a lot of time to implement this and to learn the new procedure. You know, especially uh, our local clerks. In Michigan, we, we have, I think, the or one of the most decentralized election processes in the country which makes our elections secure. It's one of the good things. You know, you can't hack our elections in Michigan because we are all so decentralized. Like, um, I don't control the elections in the county. Uh, but, you know, that will also take a long time to train everyone. I have quite a few clerks in my county who, this is just their part-time job. Mm -hmm. 
they just work out of their homes. They don't go to work eight to five every single day like I do. So there will be pieces of this that I think will take longer than, absol absolutely take longer than 45 days. But that's to be expected. Um, you know, that was the same thing that happened back in 2018. Right. Yeah, that, that came in pieces and it, you know, the proposal got passed, but then the Bureau of Elections had to, I guess, issue guidance sure. on how to make it work. We've got a couple minutes left. I'm going to put up your, your websites, both the Bay County website and also the Voters Not Politicians website so that folks can, uh, if they want more information in Bay County to reach you, Kathleen, mm -hmm. or to reach uh, Nancy and her team for Voters Not Politicians. If, you know, in your case, uh, Kathleen, they want to be a volunteer, they can get that information there. With Voters Not Politicians, they want to advocate, uh, they want to volunteer, they can get more information there. So I'm going to ask you both this, I guess, th this election, a lot going on. We've got three ballot proposals in Michigan, got the abortion issue, we've got this issue, we've got term limits. Obviously, we've got the midterms uh, nationally and locally. That, so, Nancy, do you think, uh, is, is the voter rights sort of proposal getting lost? Do you think that's a driving force that's driving, that will drive people to the ballot box, I guess? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, again, it, it, these issues, these voting rights are broadly um, popular, uh, you know, across the political spectrum. So I do think that people will um, want to go to the ballot in order to vote for these proposals, including Proposal 2. Um, that's one of the messages that we're just trying to get out to people is that this is a really important election. Show up and vote your whole ballot, you know, both sides, um, the partisan and the nonpartisan um, sections. So, Kathleen, what do you think? I mean, when we talked before the show a couple of days ago, you said there's lots of millages. There's so many things going on. Mm -hmm. What's your sense about this voting rights proposal, a constitutional amendment? Do you think that will be a, one of the key reasons people go? Do you think it's getting lost in that? How important is this issue? I think all three of the statewide proposals yeah. are definitely driving people to the polls. Um, you know, it, it's specific for my county that, that there are quite a few millages. I think someone told me at one time, we might have the most in the state. But, um, you know, so, that, so that's what I'm hearing, too, is locally we have a lot of talk about those, those countywide millages and the lo township and millages, but um, I would say the state millages are getting the most attention from what I've heard. Okay. Well, Kathleen Zanotti, the Bay County Clerk, thank you so much for coming in. Nancy Wang, Executive Director of the Voters Not Politicians Group, thanks you for coming in. You guys are going to stick around for the after show. Uh, that we're going to record to give our viewers a little bit more that will show up on the web. So stick around for a moment. In the meantime, for our live viewers right now, that's our show for tonight. But be sure to join us again next Tuesday night at 8. We'll focus on education, taking on issues like school choice, critical race theory, and school funding, and its impact on the November election. That's next Tuesday night at 8. In the meantime, hit me up on social media. I would like to hear from you. Have a great night. I'll see you next Tuesday night.